Good morning again, church family. You know, I can remember when I got my very first job in ministry. There was a lot of excitement. I was fresh out of college and I got hired by a really great church and I was really looking forward to moving there and getting things started uh, and I was imagining what the future would hold and Annie and I packed up everything and we moved across the state to a new place that we, where we didn't know anybody, um, but it was exciting and we got everything settled, moved into a new house, um, I got everything sort of situated at, at the church office and started to get to know people there a little bit. And I remember sort of the first day, there was the a day that I could just come in and, and sit down at my desk and start to work. And I can remember sitting there and thinking, now what? There's been all this excitement going into this and getting, getting to this place and now is the time to start doing it, but how do I start doing it? How do I begin this process of all of these things that I've imagined? Uh, how do I start? Now what? And I can remember uh, something similar when I moved here and got situated in the office here and moved um, into the new house here and there was all this excitement and build up and then I was there and now what? Sometimes it takes some time to just sort of figure things out and, and know what to do day to day. Maybe you've been there too. Maybe every new job is kind of like that. There's a build up and then now what? We've been going through a series in the book of Acts that looks at the beginnings of the church, this movement of God that we are a part of today. Last week we saw the launch of the church and it was spectacular. With the wind and the fire of God and the Holy Spirit coming upon people and this new movement that is taking place and God working powerfully to bring thousands of people to join in in the body of Christ. And the church is launched. And I can imagine after that point, as things start to settle into a new rhythm of life, we could say, okay, now what? What does church look like now? And that's where we are today in the story in the, the book of Acts. At the end of chapter 2, we start to get the very first description of what church life looked like for those earliest Christians. And we see it here in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. Luke tells us that this early church was devoted. They were devoted. This was not something that was um, just sort of at the fringes of their lives. This was not a, a hobby that they could engage in. This was something that was central. They were devoted. And he gives us four things that they were devoted to. What's interesting is that we, as a part of the very same movement, the very same church, we are called, I think, to be devoted to the same things. These four things is what it says they are devoted to the apostles' teaching, which um, they had access to the actual apostles. They could hear their voice and get instruction directly from them. They could hear the story of Jesus from the people who were there, receive instruction about what this new life looked like from the apostles themselves. What's amazing is we have the writings of some of those very same apostles preserved for us in the New Testament. We can be devoted to their teachings as well. It also says they're devoted to the fellowship. That's the Greek word that we've talked about many times before. It's the word koinonia which means more than what we often mean when we say fellowship. It's not just about um, potlucks and playing games together, although I think that's part of it. Koinonia is about lives that are woven together, that God has brought together and made into a family. It's a deep kind of connection. It is a sharing of life, and they were devoted to that. And it says they were devoted to the breaking of bread, um, which is a way, an expression, a way of talking about sharing a meal together. And it's also a phrase that they used to talk about the Lord's Supper, which I think for them was not a separate event. 
This was something that they did when they had meals together. They shared this meal. They broke bread and they shared in the Lord's Supper. These were part of um, what, became, what came to be known as their agape feasts or their love feasts. And they were devoted to sharing that time together. And it says they were devoted to the prayers, to seeking out God. They were devoted to it. And again, we are called to be devoted to the very same things. What's interesting to me is the way that Luke phrases this, because he pairs these things up. He says, uh, the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. Then he says, the breaking of bread and the prayers. He's paired them up as if these are sort of two sides of their devotion that he's trying to show us. And I think that what we really see here in these four things are really two categories of their devotion. We see in their uh, seeking the apostles' teaching, they're looking for that divine wisdom from above that has been granted to these, uh, these apostles that God is working through to teach them. They're seeking that wisdom from above and the fellowship to uh, the, the life, the shared life together in koinonia. That's the two sides. And then we see again this, the, the shared meals, the breaking of bread together, the Lord's Supper, the communion that they share together, and then again the prayers, seeking God. And we see these two categories of things that they are devoted to, seeking wisdom from above, and sharing life together. And we find that the church must be devoted to both God and one another. The church must be devoted to both God and one another. The church needs both. It's not just about being devoted to God. And it's not just about being devoted to taking care of one another. It is about both. Um, these are the same categories of things that Jesus talked about. When somebody asked him, what was the greatest command? What is the most important thing? Jesus said this, Matthew 22, verse 37. Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Jesus says the church should be devoted to both God and one another. This is really what it means to be the church. And so we see here that there is this, um, this vertical relationship, this relationship between God and us, this personal relationship that we cultivate in seeking the teaching of the apostles, in seeking God in prayer, this vertical relationship, but there's also the horizontal relationship where we share with one another in fellowship, in koinonia, where we share with one another in the breaking of bread. And so when we think of it this way, we can recognize that the shape of the church is the shape of a cross. This vertical relationship and this horizontal relationship and the church resides right here. The church resides right in the middle, in the intersection of these two relationships. It is vital for your spiritual health and it is vital for the health of the church that we are devoted to both things. We could emphasize a personal and private spirituality. And that's what some people prefer, that my relationship with God is just between me and God and it's, and it's not about anybody else. And, 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 it's, and there is some value in cultivating that private spirituality, I guess, but it's missing something if we don't have the horizontal component. We could also be so devoted to one another that we really don't spend any time seeking the teaching of the apostles in the New Testament. We don't spend any time in personal prayer. We just are devoted to one another. We could emphasize the community aspect, but the church at its healthiest lives 
in the intersection of both. This is what it really means for us to be a priesthood of all believers. A priest is the one that, that stands right there in the intersection, seeking God on behalf of the people and showing God to the people. That's the role of a priest. And that's part of what's being described about us when we talk about being a priesthood of all believers. And it's what it means for us to be built into a temple. The temple is the dwelling place of God. Paul describes uh, the church as a temple, the, that we are each building blocks put together to be a dwelling place for God. He talks about it in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 21. The temple is the intersection between heaven and earth where God lives. And the church is in that intersection. The early church lived there, and it changed the world. When we go back to Acts and see, um, their devotion resulted in something powerful. It says here in verse 43, Awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Um, I like that this translation says that these wonders and signs were done through the apostles rather than by the apostles, because it is God that is at work here. This is, a, this is a church that is living in the intersection. They are doing what God has called them to do. They are devoted to both God and one another, and God is doing great things through them. We'll see several examples of these wonders and signs as the story of Acts goes on. But God has shown up. God has shown up and the people have witnessed his power. And that's what has happened here. That's what has happened. The church is devoted to both God and one another. And when the church is the church, God's presence and power are on display. Um, the church doesn't exist uh, to elevate itself. The church doesn't exist to show everybody how good we are. The church exists to show the world how good God is. We're not here to convince others that we are great. We are a window through which the world can catch a glimpse of the nature of God. And Luke tells us when he writes about the early church here, he says that awe came upon every soul. They experienced something of awe. When was the last time you were in awe of something? When was the last time you experienced that emotion? Um, there's a documentary called Overview that uh, there's several interviews with astronauts who have been to space and they talk about their experience of looking down uh, at the Earth and seeing it from space, and they experience something called the overview effect. I want to play just a few clips of some of the things that they have to say. I remember going through launch, which is an overwhelming experience. engines cut off, I felt myself floating out of the seat. I floated over to the window, looked out, and we were coming up over the coast of Africa. And that's when it hit me. Uh, I'm in space. And, you know, I just got incredibly excited because it's something I had dreamed about since I was six years old. I think you start out with this idea of what it's going to be like, and then when you do finally look at the Earth for the first time, you're overwhelmed by how much more beautiful it really is when you see it for real. It's just like it's this dynamic, alive place that you see glowing all the time. 
and it was truly incredible to be up there um, doing what I always wanted to do my whole life and then to kind of glance back at our planet and uh, see that view was just tremendous. I can only describe what I've seen. You know, looking down at the Earth and you see that, that line that separates day into night slowly moving across the planet. Thunderstorms on the horizon casting these long shadows as the sun sets. And then watching the Earth come alive and you see the lights from the cities and the towns. The events you see from space, like flying over thunderstorms, looking at them from the top were spectacular. Like a firework show were going on and you're looking at it from the very top. You know, shooting stars going below us or, or you know, dancing curtains of auroras. It's just um, very hard to describe all the, you know, the colors, the beauty, the, the motion. Awe, I think, is one of those words that you um, have a better understanding of once you see it, too. I felt like, you know, using the word awesome was totally appropriate when it came to describing what the planet looks like. You know, you can't take that lightly. It really, you know, you realize that you've been blessed by the opportunity to see that. It really does look like this beautiful oasis out in the middle of, of, of nothingness. You know, if you have a chance for your eyes to adjust and you can actually see the stars in the Milky Way, you know, it's, it's this oasis in, in, against the backdrop of infinity, you know, of this just, you know, enormous universe behind it. And it's, uh, um, you know, really a, a very moving experience to be able to see that um, with your eyes. So I ask you again, when was the last time you felt a sense of awe at something? Usually the things that strike us with awe are things that make us feel small, like looking down on the earth and seeing, uh, seeing all of it through the window like that. It makes you feel small. Maybe you've seen mountains, seen the ocean, looked up at the stars and had that sense of awe. Usually these are things that are created by the God that we serve. These are his creations that he is far bigger than. And I think the reason why we get a sense of awe from those things is because in his creation, we catch a glimpse of the creator behind them. Have you ever thought about this? When Luke describes this beginning of the church, when he describes what they're doing and what people see in them, he describes the response to that as awe. Can you imagine that the church is one of those things that can inspire awe in people? That people can look to the church, that they can see something going on, they can see God at work and be in awe. When the church is functioning the way that it's supposed to, it can be breathtaking. Not because we are so great, but because God's presence and power is on display. And that is breathtaking. Uh, Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount. He said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, he says to his followers, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Jesus says, do good. Why? Because it puts our good God on display. And when people see that, they give glory not to you, but to God, because they recognize him at work in you. This is what the church is called to do, to put God's presence and power on display. And so Luke's description of the early church goes on here in Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 44, he continues. And all who believed were together, and they had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And so we see here this 
uh, this early church who is living in the intersection, putting God on display for the world to see, we see this description of them sharing all of their things in common. We see a description of them trying to live as a family. This word here, that they had all things in common, that word is koinos. Common is koinos. It's the same root word as koinonia. It is them sharing in their possessions, sharing in life together, living as a family. I've heard it put this way before. Um, as, as we grow closer to one another, as we share in koinonia, as we have things in common, we develop uh, refrigerator privileges. Um, you probably have friends or family that if you go to their house um, and you want something to drink, you don't have to ask anybody. You just go to the refrigerator and you open it up. And if there's something that you want in there, you just go ahead and take it and enjoy. And maybe you have people that can come to your house and they can open your fridge. And it's just, it's refrigerator privileges because you are family. This is the way that the early church lived, only more so. And it says that when they lived this way, when they shared their things in common, they were generous. They were generous. And I really think that this is another example of the way that they are living in that intersection and putting God on display for the world. Because he, they are being generous to show that they are serving a generous God. They are providing because they are showing the God who is the ultimate provider. This way of life altered their perspective. So that blessings that they had were not merely for their consumption. But the blessings that they had were intended to be shared because that's the way things work in God's family. Blessings are meant to be shared. When we get this, we start to see that the possessions that God has blessed us with are in some ways for our enjoyment, but that's not their only purpose. It is God's way of equipping us. He is giving us the tools that we need to minister to and to care for the people around us. So what do you have? What has God blessed you with? How has God equipped you to be a blessing to the world around you? Because in God's family, blessings are meant to be shared. Um, and Luke goes on to, to tell the story of the early church this way. Verse 46, he says, Day by day, Attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. It says here that they attended the temple day by day. What gets lost in translation a little bit here is that when it says that they are attending the temple, this is the exact same word that was used in verse 42 to say that they were devoted. It's the same word. And so what we're seeing here uh, is that they are devoted together in the temple. That's what it literally says. Literally, it translates to every day they were devoted with one mind in the temple. This is the early church. Again, we see their devotion here has two arenas. Their devotion has two arenas where they live in the intersection, attending the temple and breaking bread. Attending the temple and breaking bread in their homes. And so they go out to the temple together. This is not just about going out to uh, some sort of official worship service, although there is some of that, but it is a center of public life in this community. It is where everyone goes to gather and share ideas and to do business and enjoy koinonia together. And they go there. They are devoted to going there together. It is where the apostles would often share the gospel. They would preach about Jesus, and we'll see some of that as the story goes on. 
But it wasn't just out in public, it was also in their homes where they broke bread together. Again, they are devoted and we see this two-sided thing, this intersection, this cross-shaped church that is in public and in private. Their devotion wasn't limited to one arena of life, but was wherever they were. And so we can learn from them. Uh, We can learn from them that our devotion to Christ is lived everywhere we are. It's not restricted to one part of our lives. It is everywhere we are. Um, This has been the calling for God's people from the beginning. You may remember Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6 and 7. Um, It says, These words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise. He's essentially saying this is, this is something that is for all parts of your life. It is not segmented into one time and place. It is for all of your life. Um, I think during this time of uh, shut down uh, because of, of the virus that's been going on. I hope that maybe you have been discovering or uh, remembering, re- being reminded that church has very little to do with a building. Church is not about being in a particular place at a particular time. It's who we are. Being the church is about who we are wherever we are. And this time has been a good reminder of that. Now, the gatherings that we have, we look forward to, and we can't wait to get back together. Again, they are important for us. But the gathering is not what the church is. It's one of the ways that we are equipped to be the church all the time. Um, And so don't allow your devotion to stay sort of compartmentalized in one part of your life. Don't let it just be one segment of your schedule. Be devoted all the time, wherever you are and whoever you're with. May your devotion to Christ shine through. And so to go back to Acts, uh, Luke continues talking about the early church here in verse 47. He tells us, to wrap up this section, he tells us the results of when the church is living in this way. When the church is devoted to these things, he tells us the results here in verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Um, It says that they were having favor with the people. The word their favor is the Greek word charis. It is the word that is uh, often translated as grace. They are having grace, charis, favor with the people. Why? Because they are putting God on display. And there is this irresistible goodness of God that the people are witnessing. And there's something that draws people in about that. And remember, they had a sense of awe at what they saw in this group of people. The other thing is the church grew. The Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And pay attention to the way that Luke phrases that. How did the church grow? The Lord added to their number. The Lord added to their number. Church growth was a product of the action of God. It doesn't say that Peter's sermons were so persuasive that the church grew. It doesn't say that they were so creative about their marketing that the church grew. Now, those could be helpful things, but the church grows by the power of God. God added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. 
And remember that Jesus said in John chapter 12, uh, John, uh, Jesus said in John chapter 12, verse 32, he said, I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. I will draw people to myself. And so the church grows as God draws people to himself. God draws people to himself. Somehow, this is missing from a lot of conversations about church growth strategies. Uh, sometimes we, we want to talk about you know, our, our use of technology and social media and, and trying to be relevant and uh, making sure we do all of these things right to attract people. And, and those things are helpful and we should consider those things, but we shouldn't leave this out of the conversation. We understand that we can plant seeds and we can water them, but it is God who causes them to grow. If the church will be faithful about putting Jesus on display, then he will add to his church. He will. Um, we want to have good preaching. We want to have good singing. We want to have sound doctrine. We want to be generous in our outreach. We want to have meaningful and fun programs. But they should all be about uh, building up the body to put Jesus on display and relying on God to draw people to himself. If we do that, I think that we will be beside ourselves in seeing all the growth that God will provide. And so as we wrap up here, may we be a devoted church. May we live in the intersection of God and humanity. May we live in the intersection of the sacred and the secular. May we live in the intersection of the public and the private. May God's light shine through us to reveal his goodness everywhere we go. And may God continue to add to our number those who are being saved day by day.